All right, we want to welcome you tonight to BBI, and uh, glad you're here tonight in the classroom. Those in Stanford, Nebraska, we want to welcome you. And then we have a new group that's just getting started down in uh, South America in Guyana, and uh, I think they have 21 students uh, signed up already. And uh, so they're going to start this Sunday uh, teaching down there, and uh, we're thankful to have them to be a part of Bethel Bible Institute. So uh, pray for them as uh, they get started. Take your Bibles open to the book of 1 Corinthians chapter number 6. 1 Corinthians chapter number 6. And uh, we're going to be studying those 20 verses tonight. Uh, Lord willing, we'll get through all of them. And uh, you pray for me as I teach. And uh, you pray that God will open your heart tonight to receive. And uh, let's bow and have a word of prayer and we'll get right into the lesson. Father, thank you today for loving us. Thank you for the beautiful day you've given. Thank you for all that we've accomplished today in study and in prayer, and God, for working in our hearts and lives. Thank you tonight for your word. I pray you help me to rightly divide the, the word, and uh, God, that you would just uh, bring forth truths that would help and encourage and uh, enlighten us, that we might be better lights, better witnesses for Christ. Help us now, and we'll give you praise in Jesus' name. Amen. In tonight's lesson, we'll divide this chapter into two parts. Number one, we're going to look at reproof and instruction concerning resolving disputes. You say, preacher, they have disputes in churches? Uh, you're a Baptist. You've probably been in some. Amen? So uh, we're going to talk about that tonight. And then reproof and instruction concerning fornication and other defilements. So uh, I want you to pay attention tonight, and uh, I hope I can uh, teach you something. I hope God will impart something to you from the Word tonight. Now, the first section tonight of this chapter deals with disputes between church members. Paul says in 1 Corinthians 6, 1, having a matter against another. Having a matter against another. Uh, because of their carnality, the uh, brethren at Corinth uh, were putting self-will and self-interest above everything else. And when we do that, we're yielding to the flesh, and surely there's going to be problems. And uh, this does not bring glory to Christ. And uh, they were actually suing one another and taking those uh, to court in secular court. And uh, they were taking their disputes before unbelievers. And uh, the result was that they were ruining their testimony. I've told you before and I'll say it again. The most important thing you and I have in our lives here on earth is our personal testimony. Amen. And uh, it should behoove us as Christians uh, to live a life that would be pleasing to God, bring glory to Christ, and uplift His name. And uh, our witness is a part of that. And so we need that testimony before the world. Uh, this tended to bring reproach on the church as well. If you're a part of a local New Testament church tonight... Not only do you have a personal witness, but that church has a witness in that community. Uh, I've been in this thing long enough, uh, almost 36 years now, and uh, I've seen how that some people talk about the church, the local church. And uh, you can go knock on doors and they'll say, well, I'd go to that church, but there's too many hypocrites up there. And my answer is this, well, won't you come on down? One more won't hurt you any. So uh, just come on down and be with us. Uh, listen, we all are capable of, of sinning. Right. We still have this fleshly nature. And uh, as we uh, look at the lesson tonight, remember the lesson from last week we studied about church discipline and uh, how important it was to maintain a credible witness before a lost and dying world. And uh, let's examine God's instruction through the Apostle Paul to this church concerning these sins. Uh, as we open tonight, we're going to look first of all again at the reproof and instruction concerning resolving disputes. Uh, and I want you to see some things that uh, Paul gives here. Paul gives instruction concerning the saints uh, going to civil courts. And uh, no doubt made up of unbelievers. And they were going to settle their disputes between one another. Uh, I want you to see first of all the surprise of the disputes. Listen to what he says in uh, chapter 6, verse 1. He said, Dare any of you 
having a matter against another, go to law before the unjust and not before the saints. Uh, Paul was giving them a little bit of rebuke here. Paul was disgusted with the saints uh, that they would uh, have such disputes in the first place. Uh, brothers and sisters in Christ are to be able to settle their disputes. We are to have a forgiving spirit. We are to have a humble spirit and yielding one to another. But too many times you don't see that. Most of the time we have the attitude, well, uh, I'm not going to get mad, I'm going to get even. And when we do that, we're yielding to the flesh and we find ourselves in trouble. And uh, he made this statement there. He said, I dare any of you having a matter against another, go to law before the unjust. And uh, when we do that, again, it damages our witness, plus it uh, brings uh, reproach upon the witness of the church. Then we see the saints in the disputes in verse number 2. He says, Do you not know that the saints shall judge the world? And if the world shall be judged by you, are ye unworthy to judge the smallest matters? Uh, think about it for a moment. These are small matters compared to what's going to take place in the future. Verse 3, he says, Know ye not that ye shall judge angels? Now, saints uh, should understand that because of their position in Christ, that one day we're going to judge sinners. You say, preacher, we're not. Jesus is a judge. Hold on, let me explain. This judgment will take place during the millennium when saints will be exalted to a high position and rule and reign with Christ. Uh, can you imagine Brother Shoemaker being the mayor of this little fair town here, Hayes, North Carolina. Uh, this may be his uh, section to judge. I don't know. But he's going to sit in judgment over the uh, someone somewhere, just as you and I will, because we're heirs and joint heirs with Christ, and we're going we're to rule with him when he comes back during the millennial reign. And, uh, you know, we, we'll, we will also sit in judgment over fallen angels uh, according to verse 3. So we ought to understand that our position uh, is most important in Christ. And we are to live Christ-like lives. Right. Then we see the settling of the disputes. Look at verse 4. He said, If then ye have judgments of things pertaining to this life, set them to judge who are least esteemed in the church. Now, they're going before people who are people of prestige and, uh, you know, uh, high esteemed uh, and now he's saying hey take it before the least esteemed in the church and, and the settling of disputes between brethren should be a matter uh, that was settled and handled by those in the church not those in the world not those in a high position but humble God fearing men that uh, had wisdom and uh, that were the brethren and although the New Testament uh, had not been written yet, but the Lord gave instruction to His disciples when He walked with them. Turn you into your Bibles to Matthew chapter number 18 and look at verses 15 through 17. Jesus made this statement to His disciples. Now, I, I want to I try to help you tonight right here and show you something. He says, Moreover, if thy brother shall trespass against thee, go and tell him his fall between thee and him alone if he shall hear thee thou hast gained a brother then verse 16 he says but if he will not hear thee then take the uh, with thee one or two more that uh, in the mouth of two witness two or three witnesses uh, every word may be established now this was a uh, an interpretation of the law here uh, it required two or three witnesses. And Jesus wasn't doing away with the law. He was fulfilling the law. And he was giving them instruction here. Then I want you to notice verse 17. And he says, And if he shall neglect to hear them, tell it unto the church. But if he neglect to hear the church, let him be unto thee as an heathen man and a publican. Now I want you to notice in that one verse there, verse 17, he mentioned the word church twice. You say, preacher, why is that significant? Well, most people don't believe the church started until Pentecost. 
Well, if it did, why is he mentioning it here? Wake up now. Right. He's talking about the church. Mm -hmm. You say, preacher, when did the church begin? Jesus said, upon this rock I'll build my church and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. I believe when Jesus called his first disciple, that's when the church began. Right. Now, what happened on Pentecost? What happened on Pentecost was this. God empowered the church. Right. There was a group of individuals gathered in a central place and they were instructed to pray and they uh, were given instruction by Christ that when they prayed that they would be endued with power from on high and in Acts chapter number 2 the Holy Ghost of God descended with tongues of fire and they began to speak in other languages and began to take the gospel unto the whole world. But I believe the church actually began when Christ called his first disciples. You say, preacher, I don't see it that way. Well, you'd be wrong if you want to. <coughs> It'll be all right. The church is already mentioned before we ever get to Acts. And it was mentioned by the Lord Jesus. Now, I'm, I'm not defending the Corinthian believers here, but they were carnal and probably did not have instruction concerning such matters. Uh, you know, sometimes... Uh, People are ignorant of the Word of God because they've never been instructed. I think that's a big problem in the Baptist church. We see people saved, we bring them to Christ, but then once we get them to Christ and we get them baptized, we forget about them. Hey, these are little babies. They need to learn. They need to grow. Uh, we homeschooled our girls. And... Uh, they had to learn and grow. We had to start out with something we could give them that they could learn uh, as little ones and then build on that as we went from year to year uh, until they graduated high school. And so we've got to instruct. And many times the Baptist church fails to instruct uh, those new converts. Uh, they need to be taken under the wing and, and they need to be instructed. And probably these Corinthians had never been instructed. And isn't it good that we now today have the whole counsel of the Word of God that we can instruct, that we can teach, and that we can have a teacher through the Holy Ghost of God that will impart things to others that we can help them learn and grow and become, uh, you know, effective Christians for the Lord Jesus Christ? Now, notice the Lord's instruction concerning such a matter. First, He said, discuss the matter privately and to make every attempt to settle it on that level. Uh, you know, the more that you uh, uh, expose something to others, the more gossip, the more backbiting, the more things that take place that uh, does not honor God. And he said, if all possible, he said, settle this thing privately. Then second, he said, if the matter cannot be settled privately, he says, try to settle the matter before... Two other brothers. Take two or three witnesses and go that every word he said may be established. Then thirdly, if that fails, the guilty party who has committed the trespass and who will not repent, he said to bring the matter before the church. And then we're to treat them as a heathen and publican if they don't repent. And uh, I, I dare say that uh, the Lord's instruction is, is not practiced much in the local New Testament church today. If I was to ask for a show of hands, how many in here have ever said in a, in a meeting where that you uh, had the pastor to call the church into uh, uh, a business meeting and uh, call the church into order and uh, discuss a, a, a matter that needed to be settled uh, between brethren or somebody who was sinning? And, uh, you know, it's just not done. People say, well, I just don't want to make any waves. I just don't want to stir anybody up. I just want to, don't want to cause any trouble. I just don't want to be a judge. Those are all lame excuses for what the Bible teaches. Now, we come down to another thought here. We want to see the shame in the disputes. Look at verses 5 and 6. Paul says, I speak this to your shame. It is so that there is not a wise... Uh, is, is, it's so that there is not a wise man among you 
No, not one that shall be able to, uh, to judge between his brother. Paul said, surely you can find somebody. He said, but brother goeth to law with brother, and that before unbelievers. Hey, the Corinthians boasted of their wisdom, but by going to court before the unsaved, they showed their lack of wisdom. You say, well, preacher, what is wisdom? Can I give you just my definition? Wisdom is the knowledge of the Word of God and how to apply it to our everyday life. You say, well, how do you get wisdom? You get wisdom from prayer and you get wisdom from reading the Bible. And the Holy Ghost of God will give you that wisdom if you'll stay in the Word and you'll ask God to help you. Uh, I believe James talks about if any of you lack wisdom, let him ask. Amen. And he'll give it to you. But James also said, we have not because we ask not. So we need to pray about these things. You know, people say, well, I, I, I'm going to pray about this and I'm going to pray about that. We ought to pray about everything. <coughs> Especially to know the Word of God and how to apply it to our lives. And what a terrible testimony before a lost and dying world that these uh, Corinthian believers were exhibiting. And, and you know, uh, what, what's being done here speaks volumes. You know, when people see church disputes, boy, uh, the world has a field day. I never like business meetings in the church. Because surely if you had a business meeting in a church and there was anything that come up, any matter that come up that you had a, a little disagreement over, you know, you know where, it was, uh, where it was tried? It was tried in the barber shop. It was tried in the post office. It was tried in the grocery store before a lot of unbelievers. Amen. Amen. And, uh, you know, it eventually filters back to the pastor. <laughs> And then you have to deal with that. So we want to be careful with our witness. And, you know, it, it says that to go before the world here and to settle disputes, that there's really no need for the church or, or any need for the gospel. Hey, the gospel changes us. And uh, we are to be obedient to the Word of God. Then we, we want to see here the counsel of the saints. Rather than to go to court to settle a dispute with a, with a saved person, Paul exhorts that the wrong person should just suffer the wrong and move on. And you say, what's wrong with that picture? Well, that's contrary to this whole flesh. Uh, but that's, uh, you know, that, that is why that the Corinthians uh, were going to court uh, and, and, you know, over their disputes... Uh, they didn't want to take any wrong. Their flesh got in the way. And, and I believe the same thing takes place today. You say, preacher, what are you talking about? We live in the day and age of lawsuits. Amen. I remember it's been about uh, maybe six or seven years ago, my oldest daughter and my youngest daughter were together and they made a left turn and uh, evidently they were talking to one another and they weren't paying attention to traffic and uh, they were T-boned by another car. Well, it knocked that, uh, her car into two other cars, totaled her car completely. And the only thing that happened was my, my daughter got a, uh, an eye cut out of it. And I thank the Lord for that. But did you know within the next 14 days, I had seven videos and probably 50 calls from lawyers wanting to take our case. Amen. They're out there. They're like vultures. They're circling. They're waiting. And, uh, you know, uh, there, there wasn't anything. She made a mistake. It was her fault. And uh, our insurance had to pay for it. Of course, the car was in my name. Insurance was in my name. So, uh, you know, I, I had to deal with it. So we want to be careful uh, in what we do because we live in that day and age of lawsuits and we're not careful, our flesh will get away. Yeah. Then 
in verse number 7, look at the humbleness in the suffering loss. He says, Now therefore, there is utterly a fault among you, because you go to law one with another. Why do you not rather take wrong? Why do you not rather suffer yourselves to be defrauded? Can I say right here that humbling the, the flesh to suffer loss is not an easy thing to do? Amen. It's not. No. Hey, when it comes to money, people will do anything. You say, preacher, I don't believe that. Well, what about House Bill 2? All these companies are going to boycott North Carolina because of our governor's stand. Mm -hmm. I'm going to stand with the governor and I'm going to stand for what's right. Amen. So uh, if they boycott us, we ought to boycott them. Mm -hmm. I mean, that just makes perfect sense. Mm -hmm. You know, we got along without some of these companies before they ever came along. Surely we can get along after that. Yeah. Amen. Amen. But that's what, that's what we see today. Right. Nobody wants to suffer any loss. Nobody wants to humble themselves. Everybody wants their own way. It goes back to what it says in the book of Judges. We live in a day uh, when every man does that which is right in his own eyes. And I'm going to tell you, that's a terrible day. Right. We're getting close to the coming of the Lord. Hallelujah. Right. We're going to get out of here. <clears throat> then we see the harm in not suffering loss. Look at verse 8. He said, Nay, ye, ye do wrong and defraud, and that your brethren. You know, if one believer insists on taking another believer to court before unbelievers, uh, you know, harm is brought to one's personal testimony, and you end up doing harm to the believer uh, who has harmed you. Can I say right here, it's a no-win situation? You, you're going to make an enemy, an enemy of your own brother. You're going to make enemies of that particular person's friends. They're not going to like you very much. They're going to backbite. They're going to talk about you. They're going to gossip. And before you know it, you've got strife and dissension in the church. And again, the church loses witness in the community. Yeah. Did, you, did you hear what they done? And before you know it, it's spread everywhere. Now, in verses 9 through 20, we're going to look at reproof and instruction concerning fornication and other defilements. And in these verses, Paul instructs the Corinthian church on the sanctity uh, of the body in Christian service. Now, first, sanctification of the body has no effect upon the believer's salvation. I'm as saved today as I'll ever be saved. Now, in saying that, let me say that sanctification or being set apart is necessary for effective service. You will not have a witness. You will not have a testimony if you're not separated to some point and you're not set apart to some point. And if you'll go back and you'll study the Scriptures, and here's where you leave most Baptists, if you'll go back and study your Scriptures, all the way from Genesis, all the way through, God's people have always been a separated people. Paul's going to give instruction in, the, in the, the next book coming out from among them, be separate, saith the Lord. But most people think the preacher's the one saying that. It's not. I, I never wrote it, I only quote it. The people just don't want to separate themselves. They want to give in to the flesh and to the world. Let me say, secondly, sanctification refers to the setting apart of the body for the use of God. Remember what Paul told the, the, the Roman uh, people there when he uh, wrote the book of Romans in Romans 12, 1 and 2? He said, I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, 
that ye present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. Mm -hmm. And be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind and prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. Our body is for God's use. And yet many times we don't want to separate ourselves from the world and set our body aside. Hey, a woman who loves her husband is married to him or separate herself from the world. Amen. Amen. But we don't find that too often anymore. Better be careful. Thirdly, sanctification of the body is dedication to the holy living that will render the believer fit for God's use. God's not going to use a dirty vessel. God's not going to use a vessel that uh, uh, is full of sin. Let's think about it like this. I got a dishwasher at my house. Sometimes I do them, but I got a dishwasher. You ever go to the dishwasher and reach in there and get a glass and pour you a glass of milk? And when you pour that glass of milk, there's a whole bunch of little things that floating around in it. You go drink that? I don't think so. You don't know what it is. Use food particles. Pepper, maybe a little piece of garlic, <coughs> some leftover spaghetti. It's hard to say what's in there. It's dirty. It's a dirty vessel. And it, it, it can't be used. But we don't mind what our eyes see and what our ears hear and, you know, uh, the things we visualize and hear every day that uh, defiles our body. Amen. Amen. We need to bring our body under subjection. Now, notice in verses 9 through 11, we're going to look at the sanctification of our body because of position. What are you talking about, preacher? I'm talking about our standing in Christ. Listen to what he says. Number one, God condemns sin. Let me say that. In verse 9, he says, Know ye not that the unrighteous shall not inherit the kingdom of God? Be not deceived, neither fornicators, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor effeminate, nor abusers of themselves with mankind, nor thieves, nor covetous, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor extortioners shall inherit the kingdom of God. Hey, Paul speaking uh, to this church, trying to get them to realize their position in the Lord Jesus Christ. Hey, we're a part of the body of Christ. We were baptized into the body of Christ by the Holy Ghost the day we got saved. And we're a part of His flesh and a part of His bone, and we ought to act like it. We ought to dress like it. We ought to talk like it. And, you know, the very principle of our inheritance and our being uh, an heir condemns sin. We ought to hate the things that God hates. We ought to desire the things that God desires. And if we'll do that, I guarantee you we'll live a more victorious life. And, you know, inheritance is not con concerned with what you are, but rather who you are in the Lord Jesus Christ. We're somebody. We don't act like it sometimes, but... And I'm not being boastful in what I'm saying. I'm saying we are somebody in the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. And what's happened across America is that we've not stood up as Christians and we've not voiced our right and we've not voiced uh, our opinion against wrong and now it... wrong is the norm. I want to say right here that there's no candidate that's going to enter the White House that's going to change America. Only God can change America. And we better get with the program. 
because I'm going to tell you, it's, it's, it's going to be tough in the next few years. The, the practice of sin condemns, and Paul points out, the, the sins, uh, you know, uh, they're ungodly by naming what they do. He said, hey, we're talking about fornicators. We're talking about idolaters. We're talking about adulterers. We're talking about effeminate. We're talking about abusers of themselves with mankind. He's talking about homosexuality. Mm -hmm. He's talking about thieves and covetous and, and drunkards and revilers and extortioners. And he said, they shall not inherit the kingdom of God. Mm -hmm. Be not deceived, he says. Those who willfully commit the sins named will not have a part in the inheritance God has prepared for those who have believed and been saved by the grace of God. They're not going to have a part in that. My pastor says this all the time, and I believe it. Where there is no fruit, there is no root. Amen. That's right. You say, well, preacher, what, what is the fruit of the Spirit? Well, turn to Galatians. Turn to Galatians. And look in chapter number 5 and verse 22. And I want you to notice this. Notice how it's worded. But the fruit of the Spirit, singular, fruit of the Spirit, is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, temperance. Against such there is no law, and they that are Christ have crucified the flesh with the affections and lusts. In other words, we have brought our bodies under control. And too many times people don't want to do that. Too many times people want to act and dress like the world. Can I tell you, we don't have to have designer clothes and designer shoes and designer accessories. I grew up poor. I got one pair of shoes to go to school in and one pair of work boots a year. And I had to make them last me a year unless I outgrew them. Sometimes I outgrew them. We didn't have a lot. And we didn't have to have designer stuff. But, you know, I see it all the time. You, you see two-year-olds, and I got a grandson that's almost two, and a lady brought a bag of clothes to him the other day and said, uh, I want you to go through this and see if there's anything in there you can use. And my daughter can't devote, uh, you know, afford designer clothes, but when she started going through them, there was a bag full And I mean high dollar stuff. I'm talking about sixty and seventy and eighty dollar outfits or more mm -hmm. for a two year old. Yeah. He's only gonna be in them two or three months. Yeah. Right. You see, we yield too much to the flesh. Right. We need to come back to a day of simplicity. Mm -hmm. Amen. That's why America's where she's at today. Everybody wants a bigger car. Everybody wants a bigger house. Everybody wants what everybody else has got. Well, I just got to have one of them. I've had the Corvettes. I've had the bass boats. I've had the campers. I've had all that. But you know what? I really didn't have that. It had me. Because what I was doing was... was trying to make money and make a living to keep up with the payments. Yeah. <laughs> Amen. Right. I drive a eight-year-old car and a 15-year-old truck now. And I'm just as happy as a, <laughs> a coon in a corn patch. Amen. Got some cosmetic damage on it, but that don't hurt the driving of it. You keep oil in it and keep it maintained. Hey, that thing will last a long time. My car's got 237,000 miles on it and my truck's got 285,000. 
and they're still running. Mm. We we've just got plumb bent out of shape and yielded to the flesh. Mm. Hey man, that didn't cost you nothing extra. <laughs> Secondly, let me say, God cleanses the sinner. Notice what he says in verse 11. And such were some of you. And such were some of you. Some of you were what? Well, some of you were fornicators, idolaters, adulterers, effeminate, abusers of themselves with mankind, thieves, covetous, drunkards, revilers, extortioners, God changed all that when we got saved. And such were some of you. Now, listen to what he says. But ye are washed, but ye are sanctified, but ye are justified in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and by the Spirit of our God. Amen. Hallelujah. Amen. Thank God for the change. Now, notice what he says here. Regeneration. But ye are washed. Uh, I preached to the children's church on Sunday. And I, I told him, I said, listen, I preached out of 1 Corinthians 6, 19, 20, because that's what I've been studying. And I, I, I told him, I said, uh, you're made up of what we call genes. I said, to get so many genes from your dad, so many genes from your mom, uh, that's DNA. They understand that stuff at, you know, six years old now. And uh, I said, that's in your genes. I said it determines your hair color, your eye color, your personality. I said it determines a lot of things. But I said, think about this. When God saved us, God regened us. Amen. You're saved, preacher. He didn't. Listen to what Titus 3 5 says. Not by works of righteousness which we have done, but according to his mercy he saved us by washing of regeneration, regening by watching a regeneration and renewing of the Holy Ghost. God changed us. He regened us. I, I got heavenly genes now. Amen. I'm washed. I'm made clean in the blood. But ye are washed. You're regenerated. Now, note the term here. The term regeneration means to bathe the whole person and to be washed off. Hallelujah. I've been made clean. I've been washed. Washed in the blood. What can wash away my sins? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. Hallelujah. I'm about ready to run. <laughs> Think about that. We've been made clean. We've been delivered from all that mess. Then notice he says sanctification. But ye are sanctified. The word sanctified comes from the Greek word hagathio. And it uh, means to make holy, purify, to consecrate, to set apart. We ought to be set apart. And, and notice, it is in the past tense. Sanctify. Amen. Meaning, it is never to be done again. You can't get saved over and over and over again. Yeah. God saves you once. God sets you apart one time. Amen. And we just have to rest and trust in Him. Then notice this, justification. He says, but ye are justified. And the word justified comes from the uh, Greek word dujeo, uh, meaning to be made equitable by implication, innocent, holy, free. And, and also in the past tense, meaning it is never to be done again. Just as if I'd never sinned. I'm justified. Amen. And yet, we don't live like that. We yield to the world. Now, notice here. God changes the sinner. Verse 11, the first part says, And such were some of you. Look at the degree of unrighteousness here. Such. The word such refers to that kind, that degree that capability. Mm -hmm. Hey, if it wasn't for the grace of God, you know what I could be today? I could be an adulterer. I could be a thief. I could be a drunkard. I could be anything. That Paul mentioned uh, aforehand here. Uh, any of those things I could be, was it not for the grace of God? Amen. Amen. We're all capable. Yes. 
And yet we go around pointing the finger one to another when we ought to be praying one another for one another. There, there's an old song that the primitive quartet sings and not too many people shout on it. I get a shouting spell every now on it. Uh, when, 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 when you see me in a fault, he's talking about this. He said, don't go tell another. He said, go and tell Jesus on me. Right. If you are my brother, don't go tell another. Go and tell Jesus on me. Right. Hey, but you know what we like to do? We like to get in our little circles yeah. and say, you know, we really need to pray for so and so. Did you hear what they done? <laughs> Be careful. <laughs> Be careful. May come back to haunt you one day. <clears throat> and such were some of you, he said. Then the difference of righteousness. You see the degree of unrighteousness. Look at the difference of, uh, of righteousness. Were. The word were is in the past tense referring to what we used to be. Now, that can be attached in a couple different ways. I, I, I'd like to think that I would use it in the right context and, and you know, be transformed from what I used to be to what I am now in the Lord Jesus Christ. But a lot of times, you'll knock on a door to witness to somebody and they'll say, well, you know, I used to be a deacon. I used to be a Sunday school teacher. I used to be a superintendent. I've even had some say, well, you know, I used to preach the gospel. I don't want to be a used to be in that, in that sense of the word. I want to be used of God. I want to glorify Him. I want to magnify His name. We were changed. It's in the past tense. And thank God that, that, that we have been changed. Amen? Right. Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. All things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. On October the 28th, 1980, on a Tuesday evening, 5.30 p.m., on the West Virginia Turnpike, I got changed. Right. Now, you can ask me anything from that time to the present, but from that time back, don't ask me anything because it's gone. Right. It's gone. Thank God it's gone. Right. And I, I, God's not going to remember it anymore, and there's no use for me to bring it up. There's no use for me to talk about it. Because I'm, I'm clean. I, I'm washed in the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. <laughs> I'm sanctified. I'm justified. I've been washed. Thank you. If you've been saved, so have you. Yes. Now, sanctification of our body because of purpose. Think about that. Perfect liberty. Paul says in verse 12, All things are lawful unto me, but all things are not expedient. He says, all things are lawful for me, but I will not be brought under the power of any. Then verse 13. He said, meats for the belly and belly for the meats, but God shall destroy both it and them. Now the body is not for fornication, but for the Lord and the Lord for the body. Hallelujah. When we get that in our mind and in our heart and we let that sink in and we allow the Holy Ghost of God to take control of our lives, uh, it, it'll change us. Right. The, those in the church at Corinth had no inhibitions. They, they lived in a culture that promoted desires of the flesh and they openly practiced those desires in the church because they had no discipline. Mm -hmm. They had no self-discipline and they had no church discipline. You see, I don't have to go around policing everybody. I just need to police me. I believe Paul said, let a man examine himself. Right. Well, now you know, preacher, I'm a fruit inspector. You better be careful. Yeah. Amen. Right. Lawfulness to the believer here. Notice what he said. He said, all things are lawful unto me. Paul stresses that all things are lawful for the believer but that it is, is not to say that we are not to restrict our behavior and rule by rules and regulations that would enable us to live a life that would glorify God. Hey, there's got to be some restrictions on our lives. You say, preacher, what are you talking about? Well, he said 
And notice here the principle of limitation. He said, but all things are not expedient. You know, I, I'm not being a legalist here, but, but what I'm saying here is that we need to establish some standards and convictions based on the Word of God and by the convicting power of the Holy Ghost that, that our purpose should be in, in pleasing and glorifying God. Right. That's what God wants us to do on a daily basis. Hey, it's not just church on Sunday morning and Sunday night and Wednesday night and then live with the devil the rest of the week. God wants us to live a, a, and walk daily with Him. And, and think about this. Uh, although we have perfect liberty, there are certain reasons that, that we should restrict ourselves. You know, some things we do will subdue the believer. I don't want to be brought back under the flesh. I don't want to be controlled by the flesh. I want to be controlled by the Spirit of God. And the more we yield to God, the more we'll be controlled by God. The more we pray, the more we read God's Word, the more we put that Word in our heart, hey, the closer we'll draw to God. And when we yield to the desires of our flesh, we, we're held captive. I think about people tonight that are held captive by, by alcohol. I think about people tonight that are held captive by pornography. I think of people tonight that are held captive by drugs. And, you know, they're yielding to those desires of the flesh and not yielding to God. God created our body for Him. That's what, what the Bible said there. Now, the believer's liberty is not a license to sin. Our liberty is regulated by God's moral law. It's found all through His Word. And just like we have liberty to live and to make choices of our lives that will bless us, we can also make choices that will harm us. The word expedient here means profitable or beneficial. He said all things are not expedient. All things are not profitable or, or beneficial. So we want to choose the things that are profitable and that are beneficial that will help us to, to go forward for God. Can I, can I give you a little illustration here? Everybody in here got driver's license now? Just a little simple illustration. I've got a driver's license. That gives me the right to drive anywhere in the United States, even though my license is in North Carolina. Amen? Right. I can drive anywhere. I can even drive in Canada, Mexico, on my North Carolina license. But guess what? I am required to drive by the speed limit and by the laws that are made by each state. Amen. Doesn't give me the right because I have the liberty to drive to break the law. Amen. But yet, the same thing applies to us in, in our Christianity. We're free. We're free moral agents. We can make choices. But it doesn't give us the right to make wrong choices. That'll harm our witness. And, and you know, because I have liberty, to drive does not mean that I can exceed the speed limit or break other traffic laws. What was that little slogan they had last week? If you don't obey the signs, you'll pay the fine. There's payday coming. Right. Amen. Now, let's look at the perspective and the liberty and the limitation. Now, the body is the Lord's, but for the Lord, He says. Now, uh, as believers, we must determine where our liberty ends and where Christ's Lordship ends begins. Now, I'm not teaching Lordship salvation here. Christ is Lord. Whether you make Him Lord or not, He is Lord. We just got to learn to yield ourselves to Him as our Lord. Amen. And we must understand that our body is for the Lord and the Lord for the body. That's what Paul's talking about here. Now, notice verses 14-18. through 18. We see the sanctification of uh, of our body in the promise. God has promised the believer eternal life 
And that life began the moment we got saved. And it'll never end, but to be enjoyed, you know, when, when we receive the new body, when Christ returns. Remember 1 Corinthians 15, 51 through 57. Read that tonight. I, I, I don't want to take time to read it all. But our body is going to be changed. This mortal is going to put on immortality. This corruption is going to put on incorruption. We're going to be changed in a moment in a twinkling of an eye. So God has given us a body and given us a promise that one day this body's going to be sin free. Hallelujah. Amen. And we won't be controlled by the things here on this earth. Now, through, through this, though our old body will decay, we have a promise from God that He'll raise it up just like He did the Lord Jesus Christ. We'll have a glorified body. Then the position of the body. Look at verse 15. He said, Know ye not that your bodies are the members of Christ? Shall I then take the members of Christ and make them a, the, the members of a harlot? He said, God forbid. Uh, this great truth applies to the believer uh, only and uh, is uh, an exhortation uh, to promote holy conduct as we live our lives here in the flesh. We belong to Christ. Amen. And being a member of, the, of Christ's body prohibits foul morals and bad conduct. Christ's not going to allow that in your body. He's going to get your attention somewhere. And I'd rather take a whipping by ten good men than I would to fight the Holy Ghost. Amen. Guarantee you that. Look at the partnership in the body. He said, What? Know ye not that he which is joined to an harlot uh, is one body? For two saith, uh, He shall be one flesh, but he that is joined unto the Lord is one spirit. Now, pa Paul addresses the sin of immorality here, and, and he's doing it in a manner of rebuke. That the sin was evidently prominent in the church, and evidently, uh, you know, uh, Paul had to address that situation. And, and the way he's addressing it here, uh, it's a pretty serious thing. And think about this. In, in marriage, the Bible speaks of the fact that when two are joined together, they become one flesh. Amen. I, I'm not being vulgar here, but think about this. Sexual union joins two as one. And Paul is rebuking them for their fornication, pointing out that it's incongruent uh, for a believer to be joined uh, to the partner uh, as a harlot. It's not going to happen. God's not going to let it take place. Then the peril of the body. Look at uh, verse 18. He said, Flee fornication. Every sin that a man doeth is without the body, but he that committeth fornication sinneth against his own body. Think about this. The sin of fornication must be avoided at all costs. Immoral conduct, uh, uh, you know, by a, a believer is a terrible sin. And those who practice such conduct will suffer the consequences uh, of their actions in the flesh. Amen. Right. That's where all your venereal diseases and AIDS and all these things come from. Something to think about. And if a believer, you know, continues to practice uh, these type of sins, they're surely going to be an accounting day before God. Mm -hmm. Now, in the last two verses, we see the sanctification of our body because of possession. Think about this. Get this in your mind. Our body, our body is the temple of the Holy Ghost. Amen. Our body is the temple of the Holy Ghost. And because He uh, abideth within, can, can you imagine the sorrow and the grief He feels when we desecrate our temple? Now, some of you haven't had children yet. I've had that pleasure. And sometimes it was a displeasure. <laughs> when you think about sometimes the way our children hurt us and the grief and the sorrow they cause us, think about how God feels when we grieve the Holy Spirit of God. We're grieving God. And, you know, when we do wrong, we're grieving God. No matter how big, no matter how little, we're grieving God. And the Holy Spirit is our possession. 
Paul calls their attention to this in verse 19. He said, What? Know you not that your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost, which is in you, which you have of God, and you are not your own? He says, Hey, we don't belong to ourselves. But now, preacher, I have my human rights. I've got my rights. When you got saved, all your rights were surrendered to Him, or were supposed to be. Mm -hmm. Amen. And, and you know, we like to think we do, but, but just as the Holy Spirit uh, dwelt in the tabernacle and then the, the temple of the Old Testament days, now He indwells the believer, and our rights, as, as we see them, uh, you know, must be surrendered to the Lord Jesus Christ. Every Christian should, should seek to be Spirit-filled. Ephesians 5.18 says this, And be not drunk with wine, where it is excess, but be filled with the Spirit. And let me say tonight, being filled with the Spirit is not an option, it's a command. It's not an option, it's a command. It's not just for the preacher, for the deacon, for the Sunday school te teacher, or the choir director, or, or, or the superintendent. It's for every Christian. And could you imagine what would happen on a Sunday morning or a Sunday night or a Wednesday night when we got prayed up and we got full of the Holy Ghost and we come into church? I want to tell you, uh, it, it would be glory everywhere. But you see, we come to church with all that worldliness on us and in us. <laughs> and we sat there and said, well, you know the choir was off tonight. Well, you know, preacher, he, I just really didn't get nothing out of the message tonight. Hello. Yeah. Did you put any time praying in for the, the man of God? Did you say when you come, God, speak to my heart tonight? Hey, I, I don't care whether God speaks to anybody else in the church. I, I like that. But I want Him to speak to me when I go there. Amen. I want to have my time with Him. And I can because He's mine and, and uh, I belong to Him. The Holy Ghost dwells within me. And, and you know, what, what I find today, Spirit-filled Christians reap the blessings of God and can enjoy a life of victory over the flesh and the devil and the world. But you know what happens? Most Christians just live close enough to God to be miserable. They come to a point and they say, well, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to give myself wholeheartedly to God and then they draw back. And, and, you know, they're running around wringing their hands wondering what I'm going to do. Hey, it's one day at a time trusting Him on a daily basis. Moment by moment, hour by hour, day by day, week by week, month by month, year by year until the Lord comes. And that's the way we've got to live our lives, depending upon Him. And, and you know, he closes out in verse 20. We see the believer uh, is God's possession. He said, for ye are bought with a price, therefore glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are God's. Hey, God paid the ultimate price when Jesus died on the cross of Calvary for our redemption. And when He sent Jesus to die in our place, think about the love that God had for us. Think about what He did to His own Son. He that spared not His own Son, Paul said, but delivered Him up for us all. But it doesn't stop there. How shall He not with Him also freely give us all things? Everything we need is found in God to serve Him and to have victory if we draw close to Him. God drawed us to Him. To him. God saved us even though He knew all about us. Listen to this as I close. That God commendeth His love toward us, and while that we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Much more than being now justified by His blood, we shall be saved from wrath through Him. For if we, when we were sinners, uh, were enemies, He says, we were reconciled to God by the death of His Son, much more being reconciled, we shall be saved by His light. And not only so, but we also joy in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, by whom we have now received the atonement. Hey, it's all paid for. Jesus paid it all, all to Him, I owe. Sin had left a crimson stain. He washed it white as snow. And realizing the great love that God had for us, and the great price that He paid as a ransom for our sins, 
We, we should desire to live a life pleasing unto God that would glorify Him in our body and in our spirit, Paul said, which are God's. I don't belong to me anymore. You don't belong to you anymore. We belong to God. Thank God that He loved us poor wretched sinners enough to make us a part of His family. Amen. Hallelujah, what a Savior. Let's pray. Father, thank You tonight for our time together. I pray that I've helped, I've enlightened, I've been a blessing. God, that's all I wanted to be tonight. I want to be used of You. God, I pray that we'll learn to yield to the Spirit and God, that we'll learn to uh, live a life uh, and a witness before others that would be pleasing to You and point others to, to the Lord Jesus Christ. Help us now. Be it Brother Schumann as he comes in a few moments. We'll give you praise in Jesus' name. Amen.